But being on time for work duty is also key. So making sure that you are um, on time for work duty is also a part of your character assessment, okay? So your worship duty is a part of your character, <laughs> character assessment. So just wanting to make you all aware of that, if you were not aware of that, um, that being on time and being there when everybody else is is very key for making sure that we are all push, pulling our load, okay? So, and we appreciate you coming in so early and preparing the food for breakfast in the mornings. I know it's rough. But no, I am up at 5 o'clock already also, so. <laughs> so I'm there, just not here, <laughs> but I am up at that time. So, um, okay, I think we're ready. Thank you. Yes, you don't need this. Yes. I always hand it off. <laughs> you don't need that. Well, let's it <coughs> So, so um, as, we, as we're looking now at the second generation, um, getting into the promised land. I, 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 just want, I just want you guys to understand that the first generation, you know, had that whole experience at Mount Sinai where they received the law and basically God telling them how they, 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 they need to live, how they need to honor uh, the covenant of God. And as these guys are right at the border of the promised land, as a second generation, um, and Moses is telling them what God has done for the parents in the first generation, this becomes like the Sinai experience for them. And basically what Moses is doing here is, I believe he's building faith in them, but he's also telling them when you enter into the promised land, this is how you're supposed to live your lives. This is how you're supposed to live your lives. This is how you walk in obedience continually to God. Because Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means second law. So they, they, they're receiving sort of what the, 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 the first generation received because cause Moses wants them to have that understanding. He wants them to have the knowledge. He wants them to be able to live in a, in a manner that, that honors the covenant, in, honor, in a manner that honors God as they get into the promised land. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, we just looked at a bunch of scriptures that showed that they actually did what they were meant to do. Um, so in the book of Joshua, they, they eliminated the military threat. They eliminated the military threat. You're going to notice the repetition of the word, and, uh, and they took or they captured, I don't know what uh, the, uh, the NLT says, but you will, you will notice a repetition of that. Okay? They captured land. They took land. Uh, they did this. Uh, they were eliminating the military threat. In other words, they were actually just defeating these people and, and taking the land. Okay. Whereas the next generation might have a little bit of a different task. They still have to, they still have to deal with the land, but I think they were meant to focus more on a, uh, to er eradicate this, uh, the spiritual threat. Because God says, if you don't drive these people, you will start worshipping their gods instead of worshipping me. Which is what happened. So we'll get there. And see, uh, such a sad story. Okay? So this week, we'll, we're, we're starting to look at things when things are really looking good for the, the, the Israelites. And, and we're going to journey with their, with their story and their history to a time when things got really, really bad. And that's really sad. Okay, so we want to look at um, the uh, enemies. Who are these guys taking, taking out? <laughs> yeah, lots of ites. <laughs> lots and lots of ites. <laughs> okay, so so if you go back <laughs> I 
I'm just going to give you a few scriptures where you can find references, uh, or a few references to these ites. Um, so in Genesis chapter 15, verse 17 to 21, this is where God speaks to Abraham, and he says, I will give you the land, uh, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, uh, the Amorites, the Canaanites, you also find this in Exodus. Can you guys see my green from the back there? Yes, okay. Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, 13, verse 5. This one uh, omits Perry's eyes. Twenty-three, verse twenty-three, thirty-three, verse two, thirty-four, verse eleven, Deuteronomy, chapter twenty, verse seventeen, Joshua. One verse nine or nine verse one. Let me just check this quickly. Okay. In Judges What do you realize when you look at Joshua and Judges is that these guys, these, these ites, they are a tough crowd. Okay? They're not going to just hand the land to the Israelites on a platter. They are fighting for the land. They do not want to go. Right? Remember God says this land is full of milk and what do you think that means? Sweet, yes. <laughs> what does it mean? It's, it's, it's fertile land, it's productive land, it's a good land, right? And they're not just going give it, to give it away, they're going to fight. But of course we know from this book that God fights for the Israelites. He fights on their behalf and they get the land especially in, uh, in, uh, in Joshua. All right, let's look at the... Uh, so what I'm doing right now is just covering some uh, big picture stuff for the book, and wanna, I'm, I'm going to come back and look at specific things and look at some application. Okay. Okay, so... Um, So as you can see, east of the Jordan, we have two and a half tribes. Okay, that's the tribe of Reuben, that's the tribe of God, and half tribe of Manasseh. So as they were as they were journeying towards the promised land, um, these guys had decided, look, we're going to camp here. We're going to stop here, the two and a half tribes. And initially Moses was not happy about it, but he was okay with it later after a discussion. Okay, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk some more about that. Okay, and the other nine and a half. Are on the west of uh, River Jordan. Right, observation skills. Which tribe is missing from this chart? The tribe of Levi. Were they forgotten? No. What happened? <laughs> that was impressive, guys. 
What happens? Yes. God says he is their portion. They are not going to get, get physical land. But um, God is their portion. Okay? So, so where do they stay? Where do they stay? That's a very good question. All right. So I'll answer this just now. <laughs> the tribe of Levi did not get an inheritance. The offerings by fire. I keep making this mistake. To the Lord are their inheritance. So let's, uh, let's have somebody read Joshua 13, verse 14. Joshua 13, verse 14. Thirteen, verse fourteen. Thirteen. Joshua thirteen. If you are there, just go out and read it. Thirteen, verse. Moses did not assign any allotment of land to the tribe of Levi. Instead of, instead, as the Lord had promised them, their allotment came from the offering burned on the altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay. Do you want to also read fourteen four? Fourteen, verse four. The descendants of Joseph had become two separate tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and the Levites were giving no land at all, only towns to live in with surrounding pasture lands for their livestock and all their possessions. Uh, Good job. <laughs> okay, so they, so they received cities okay, for their dwelling and also pasture lands for their, for their livestock. Okay, yes. Why is Gad up there? Because Gad seems to have his own little unit. On the left side. On the left side. There's Dan, but there's no Gad. God is here. Yeah, but why isn't it listed? Why? So, so these, these two and a half, Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh, are on the east side of the Jordan River. They decided to, to dwell here. And basically, the, the agreement there was that all the fighting men would cross over the Jordan and help the other tribes get their land, and then they, they would go back. So you will see at the end of the book of um, Joshua, uh, Joshua says to them, yeah, you have actually done what you agreed to do with Moses, and now you can go back. Now you can go back. Okay? So they settled here, went, fought together with the others, and then... They went back. Okay. Does that? I just didn't understand why Gad wasn't listed on, on the left side. You have God, no, this is Dan. On the map, on the list, where you wrote all the names down. Oh, okay. Okay, I understand now. <laughs> so I missed one. <laughs> so so this, is, this is not me, but this is me. <laughs> Excellent observation skills. <laughs> okay. I, I, I missed one. Okay. I actually struggled to fit, to fit all of them there. I think that's, that's what happened. So when I was trying to fit all of them, I think one just kind of <laughs> fell off or something. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Why do you think these guys decided to stay east of the Jordan, the two and a half tribes? Why do you think they decided to stay east of the Jordan? Anyone wants to try? Yes. Exactly. So if you go to Numbers 32, Numbers 32, verse 1. Numbers 32, verse 1. Can somebody read that for us?
Good, thank you. So they, were, they had many livestock, and when they saw that the land was good for, the, for their flocks, they decided, you know what, we will camp here because this is good for us. This is good for our livestock. Okay. Um, and with this, there were also cities of refuge. Okay? Cities of, uh, of refuge. So, um, so the city of Beza here for, for Reuben, uh, Hebron, for Judah, and Shechem, for Ephraim, and the other surrounding tribes there, and Ramoth, and Golan, and Kadesh. Why did they have to have cities of refuge? Correct. So if somebody killed someone without intent, they had to go to a city of refuge and take refuge there, just in case the avenger of blood would come, af you know, come after them. So what they were required to do was go to the city, go to the, to the gate of the city, and explain their case to the elders of the city. Then the elders of the city would take them and bring them in and give them a place to, to, to stay. And if an avenger of blood would come looking for that particular person, the elders of the city would not give them up because they have taken refuge within their city. All right. You guys doing well so far? Yes. Good. Good. So uh, let's, uh, let's go back to the beginning of Joshua. Beginning of Joshua. All right, so the very, the very first sentence of chapter 1 of Joshua says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, my, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. Now from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Okay. So Moses take, takes leadership here. The command is very clear. You are going in. All right. So Joshua assumes leadership and he goes and he leads the people. Right. Um... The next thing that he does is he sends the spies. He sends the spies to Jericho. Okay? We've already dealt with uh, um, why he sent two this time. I think he's learning that number is not always, uh, you know, a large number is not always the best. So he sends two. Now, these people go to Rahab. Out of everybody, out of of all people in Jericho, they decide to go to Rahab, a prostitute. Why, why, why do you think they, they chose to go to a prostitute? Her house is in a 
Mm -hmm. So her house was uh, in a very strategic location, and it worked out for them. All right? Any other thoughts? Yes. Less likely for people to start asking questions. Hey, who is going into that house, right? Because people are always going there, right? Okay, the text doesn't tell us why they went to, to Rahab. But it ended up being a very good plan. It worked out for them. Rahab worked with them, cooperated, and saved their lives. Because they were noticed anyway that they came into the city. And uh, some people were tasked to follow them up, bring them in. Okay. Before we go any further, I, I want to I wanna go back to verse 8. Verse 8 says, this book. Why am I in Judges? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that it may be careful to do a, you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Okay, so Joshua is being challenged here. Keep this with you, because if you do, you are going to be prosperous you are going to be successful. Let's, uh, let's take a moment and, and think about us today. How would we apply this today? How would we apply this today? Thoughts? So we're not talking about truth, right, for us. We're talking about the Word of God. How would we apply this? How does this work? By making it part of our daily lives to read the Bible. What else? Are you asking specifically the verse we just read? The, the verse we just read. So if you read this and you had a time to think about it, how would you put this into practice? Any other ideas? Yes. We need, we need constant reminding. Like, he knows that we need constant reminding because we're human. And one day we'll be on our, on our good, good edge, and then the next day we may not. But if it's embedded, then it's something that coaches us throughout our life or throughout the daily events. Mm -hmm. So it's with us all the time. But it does take conscious study. Man. Yes. Thank you. Also, um, just the, where it says, don't let the book depart from your mouth, and about speaking to yourself and getting the word and speaking. Yeah. Let me tell you a story. So, when I, I did my SPS in 2008, um, when I came for my SPS, I, I pretty much. You would ask me, where do you find this scripture? And I would tell you, without any effort, this is where you find this scripture. I'd memorized a lot of this, uh, not, like, not like the word by heart, but I, I, knew, I knew the scriptures. Uh, but I, I realized at that point that I wasn't actually allowing the scriptures to do anything for me, to do anything in me. So there was a danger of just knowing stuff that's not helpful for me. Yeah. And I prayed a dangerous prayer. I said, Lord, help me forget these scriptures. And I forgot. 
I completely forgot. And what that did for me is it pushed me to the scriptures to understand the scriptures, but not only understand the scriptures, but to apply the scriptures, to live them out. Because I realized, man, I'm a dangerous Christian if I know stuff, but I don't do the scriptures. So God answered my prayer. I forgot it. I mean, even, even the John 3.16. I mean, now I know John 3.16. But I, I forgot John 3.16. For God so loved the world. And I'm thinking, yeah, what does it actually say? And I, at that moment, it was a lifesaver for me. I said, God, thank you. This is good for me. And of course, at that time, I was also doing my SPS. And uh, if you look at those verses in context, they also disappear. So it was a very, very helpful time. So my challenge to us is don't just know stuff, guys. You, you become very, very dangerous. You become a dangerous Christian, a dangerous person, if you just know the scriptures. And there's nothing wrong with knowing, but we've got to go a step further and actually apply what we know, live it out. And only then can we see true transformation. There is, there is a promise there that if we do this, we will be prosperous. Okay? And if I say this very sentence in Africa, they will be jumping up and down because they will think I'm talking about money. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm talking about the prosperity that comes with us just living out the word. We become rich that way. We become people of um, people that know God, actually. And there are many ways of doing that, guys. There are many ways of doing that. You know, you guys suggested making sure that every day we spend some time in the Word of God. Every day. Meditating on the Word of God. Just reading a scripture, and you sit down, and you start thinking about it. You start allowing the Holy Spirit inside you to reveal more about that scripture. And when he reveals more, you are going to be challenged to take what he is revealing and to live it out. Somebody told me that um, the, the, the problem they actually ha they have is with the scriptures they know. Because the problem is that they are not living it out. Some of us that have kids, we have, we have little mirrors in those kids. You know, they are, uh, like my son says, Daddy, you teach the Bible, but you just said a bad word to me. I can tell you that moment is a holy moment for me. It's a holy moment because it shows me that I need to do something. So the greatest danger for us who spend more time in the Word is, is failing to do what it says. So doing DBS, doing SPS or any Bible-related program, it's just a first step, guys. It's just, there's, there's more that we can do in order to see the, the, the Scriptures transform us. Stories are told of some villages in Kenya where people were troubled by witchcraft and the power of the enemy seemed to have been oppressing the people. And as they read the Bible and they realized that you know, they, they are sons and daughters of God and that they have power within themselves and they have authority and started praying for their communities. That even the land that was not producing food began to produce food. That is applying the word of God. All right. Um, the next thing that happens from uh, sending of the spies is that they now cross the Jordan. They now cross the Jordan. Have these guys had a, uh, do you think they have had a similar story before? 
something like the crossing of the Red Sea. And now they're doing it again. How can you imagine if you're one of the priests carrying the ark and you must, you must keep going? Basically, right? You must keep going. In front of you is a massive river that's, f that's flooding its banks, basically. And you need to keep going, trusting that it's going to be okay. The text has told us that um, you know, the waters made a wall at, uh, at Adam. Does it say that in your text? This is probably 20 or 30 miles from where they were. Heap of water, just like God did at the crossing of the Red Sea. Because we serve an amazing God. We serve an awesome God. All right, the next thing I want to look at is... Um, wow. If you have any questions on something that I'm not touching, you can always ask me. But I want to look at Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Verse 26 and 27. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 6, verse 26 and 27. And what I wanna what I wanna highlight there is that sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. So Joshua laid an oath to them at that time, saying, Cursed before the, the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up the goods. So um, um, Jericho has been destroyed. Uh, basically, Joshua had told them, you know, we're going to just march around Jericho once every day, and um, yeah, and then we're going to make a noise, and yeah. Can you think about that as a military strategy? Yeah, we've done, we've done our duty for today. And we're going to conquer this city. Next day you do the same thing. And then Joshua says, now let's shout. And they shout and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? But Joshua says, okay, God is, it, it told them, as you go into Jericho, you are not supposed to take anything from there. Total destruction. We're going to destroy everything. But then uh, somebody gets creative. And they do not listen to that. Okay? So the Lord wanted Jericho to be totally dedicated to him. You find this in Joshua chapter 6, verse 17 and 19. Joshua chapter 6, verse 17 and 19. Okay, that's why he said you're not, you're not supposed to take anything because it is mine. So Joshua never said Jericho would never be rebuilt, but he said whoever would do it would do so at the cost of his sons. Joshua says whoever will rebuild this will be at the cost of his sons. Now, this was fulfilled during the time of King Ahab, who was uh, the king of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 34. Can somebody read that for us? Okay. 
Okay, thank you. So the death of Abiram and uh, Segab shows the consequences of sin that often affect one's family members. Okay, sin has consequences. And often affects others in a significant way. So we here we see that this was not real. This was not Abiram or Segab's sin, but this was Hillel's sin, or Hiel, whatever uh, you pronounce it. But his sin affected his sons. When he dug up the foundations of Jericho, one son died, and as he completed. Jericho, another one died, according to the word of the Lord. Sin has consequences. So you notice that uh, Hiel's rebuilding of Jericho is included as part of a longer passage describing the evil that took place during King Ahab's reign in Israel. That whole story there is lumped up with a uh, a passage that's describing the evil reign of King Ahab. Ahab was a terrible king, married to Jezebel, and together they led Israel to do evil things. All right, let's look at. Um, <clears throat> Joshua chapter 7. Commonly known as the sin of Achan, which became the sin of Israel. Okay? The people of Israel broke faith in regard to devoted things. The people of Israel broke faith in regard to devoted things. So those are things that God specifically say to them, you are not supposed to take this. Just go in there and just destroy everybody except the family of Rehab and, and Rehab herself. Destroy everything. So this was a victory that became a nightmare for Israel. It's a victory that became a nightmare for Israel. So this is what happened. So the next, the next battle was against Ai. And the men of Israel said, look, you find this in chapter 8. Men of Israel says, look, you don't, we don't have to send everybody. Let's just go with, uh, with fewer people. Okay? And what happened next was very unfortunate. The men of Ai defeated them. The men of Ai defeated them. And Israel lost 36 men. 36 men as a result of one person and that's the sin of one person beca became the sin of the whole nation. So Joshua goes before the Lord and he says, God, what's happening? Why are we losing? Why are, they, are we running before the people of Ai? And, and God says to Joshua, you just rise up from there right now. Israel has sinned against me. They have broken my word. And they've taken the devoted things. So Joshua had to bring the nation of Israel tribe by tribe. The tribe of Judah was picked up. And eventually the family of Achan. And they suffered it. They suffered. Achan and his, and his family. They had to be stoned. They had to be put to death. Because they disobeyed God. So sin has consequences and our sin often affects other people. What I have heard mostly uh, with the young people of, of, of today is that my life is my life and I live it the way I want to live. My life is mine. Don't tell me how to live it. But scripture here just tells us that, look, your life is your life, but you share it with others. You share it with others. 
And if you choose to disobey God, your sin will affect others. So this individualistic view of sin doesn't really work. The scriptures tell us that, look, we are, we are members of, of, a, of a community. We are contributing members of a community. That, be, that may be your family, that may be your school, that may be your best, but you, you're not just an island. We belong to each other. And this is why this morning you started the way you started, right? Someone is not feeling well, let's pray for them. Why? Right? And sometimes there's a disconnect in our thinking there that when it's about prayer, yeah, I can, I can lean on others for prayer, but when it's about other things that reveal our selfishness, we want to go it solo. We want to go on, on our own. But I think what, we, what we're being reminded here is, number one, yes, we are an, an individual, but we belong to some kind of a community, and we always need to be aware of, of what we're doing and how we're living our lives. Because this is the reason why this is the reason why we celebrate if something happens to you as an individual and we're part of, you're part of this class. We, we celebrate God, we celebrate you because you're part of us. Now this, this is not difficult to communicate in Africa because we're a community people. There's a saying that says, Omuntu ngumuntu ngabantu. I'll explain that to you. He says, I am because you are. We share lives. And there's a community that was sharing life together. In the promised land, God punished, lost 36 men. Now, can you believe? Just imagine, take the wife of one of these men that, were, that lost their lives in battle, how would they look at Achan and his family, knowing fully that they have lost a husband, they have lost a warrior, because Achan decided not to obey God. Because I'm bringing this because not only are we, are we focused on studying the word, but we are focused on discipleship as well. And they go together. The way the disciples us. And that's why it's important for us when we read this to just take time and think about, okay, what is he saying and how can I, how can I apply this to my life? <coughs> Joshua chapter 9. Well, what happened is that uh, you know, Joshua solved this and they dealt with Achan and his family and then they went back and they actually defeated the people of Ai. Amen. They defeated the people of Ai. So Amen. it was a positive story at the end. But they learned some good things. Joshua chapter 9, commonly called the Gibeonite Deception. The Gibeonite Deception. All right. Basically what happened is that um, a bunch of kings hear what's, what's been happening. There's these people called the people of God, the people of Israel. They have come and they want to take our land. So a bunch of kings decided, you know what, we're going to come together, we're going to form a coalition, and we are going to go against them. But the people of Gideon, who are actually Hivites, they decided, well, let's take a different approach. We're going we're gonna to be creative about this. We don't really want to do this fighting thing. So they uh, took you know, fresh supplies, dried them, and then they came to the people of Israel. And when they came, they said, look, this stuff, when we left, 
our, our home, this stuff was fresh. And look at it now. Our wineskins are hard and dry. Our provisions are moldy. We come from a very, very, very far place. And here's the sad part. The text tells us that, and the man did not seek the counsel of the Lord concerning the Gibeonites. Because they actually made a covenant with them. They believed that these people were coming from a very, very far place. When in actual fact, the Gibeonites were their neighbors. And then they discovered, no. No. We've messed up. We should have sought God. We should have asked God. And God would have revealed to them. So because they made a covenant with them, they could not kill them. But they subjected them to forced labor. They were serving the nation of Israel. Why do you think the men of Israel did not seek God? I want you to turn to your seat partner and I want you to discuss this a little bit. Why do you think they did not seek God? What happened? All right, let's, uh, let's get some feedback. Let's get some feedback. Why do you think they did not seek God? Any thoughts? Yes. It's like they had so much compassion on them. They're like, oh, it's you guys, we feel so bad for you. We'll just let you in. Like, it's like it wasn't a very big problem. They're like, oh, I'm sure God probably merciful, so he'll just let them in. So, so he thinks that they were just so compassionate towards these towards his people. They didn't want to harm them. Yes? I think um, it felt nice to feel superior over someone, because the first thing they say is, we are your servants. And so I think the covenant they're making isn't like we're mutual. I think it's they're coming under like a, like last week we talked about, like a king and a vassal making the Caesarean covenant. Yeah. And I think it felt really good coming from a place of being slaves to think they're better than other people. Okay. And so why would we ask God? Like, obviously, these people want to serve us, so, like, that feels great. So there's no need to pray. Good. Good thoughts. Any, somebody from this side, yes. Uh, didn't Moses say, like, to accept sojourners and wanderers because, like, once the Israelites were them, like, they were wanderers? So I was thinking just maybe they were, like, looking at that and being like, oh, these people have been wanderers. Okay, so these people have been, you know, wandering around. 
Let's just bring them in. Okay, so what we're going to realize that the, go for it. Yeah, that, that's why this is a problem because now, because these people are supposed to be destroyed. They're supposed to be destroyed, but Israel just messed up. They've just made a covenant with the people that are supposed to be destroyed because they are part of the land they're supposed to be taking. So in other words now, even though they're serving them as, as servants, but they're sharing the land with them. That, that's why it's, it's a problem. So it's their loss. It's Israel's loss. Uh, so, so God would still, God would still, this is what it should have looked like, but now you are having to share the land with them because they're living with you. They're living in your midst. So it's your, it's your issue now. You, you can't kill them, but you have to share. Whereas the idea wasn't sharing with this, was driving them, driving them out. It's a problem because Initially, the reason why God wanted these people out is because God didn't want any influence from any of these people in the land. Yeah. Right? He doesn't want any spiritual influence that's, that's coming from the people of the land, and that's why they were supposed to be destroyed. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I don't, from God's perspective, nothing has changed. But from Israel's daily circumstances, everything has changed because now they're sharing their land with these people when they were not supposed to. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess it's just for me, it's like, since now God has to honor both of them, but it contradicts one another, then it's like a, it's, it's a, it's a broken system. Already, you know? like it's, it's become broken. Yeah. yeah. How does God deal with that? How does God deal with that? He I think God... He says that he'll do to the enemies what he, or he'll do to Israel what he's going to do to the enemies. Yes. He he'll, yeah, he lets, them, he lets them deal with the consequences of their disobedience. I think that's how he deals with them. Good question. Okay, where was I? Okay, the way I look at this verse here, with these guys coming up with such a brilliant plan, which worked, you got to look at what has Israel been through so far. Let's just look at the things that um, this second generation has experienced. Okay? They have experienced crossing the River Jordan. Right? Mm -hmm. When it's in flood. Amazing things. They have just defeated Jericho without much effort. Okay? And even though they had a bad start with uh, the people of Ai, they eventually defeated the people of Ai. Okay, so if you listen to the confession of Rehab, let's just go back there. Let's listen to the confession of Rehab. So she says in, uh, in Joshua chapter 2, verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon to Og whom you devoted to destruction and as soon as we heard it our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you for the Lord your God he is God in the heavens above and on earth beneath okay this is your confession although she's talking about the things that we experienced before, but if you just go with the things that the second generation has experienced, I think they did not see God because they rested on reputation. 
all of a sudden, they became the victors, the conquerors, the winning team, right? We are the winning team. Everybody's heart is melting because of what God is doing through us. So if you think of a reputation, they're the conquerors. They're the winners. And I think somebody mentioned it, that they're thinking, look, we're on the, we're on the winning team anyway. You know, what, what's, what's wrong with just having these guys come? You know, they've come from far anyway. And let's just have them, you know. Let's spare them. I think they rested on reputation. And the reputation of being winners. And because of that, they fail to seek God in the matter. I think I must have listened. Well, I think also uh, it just like shows how even like after experiencing like slaying on the Jordan and all the miracles, how they started seeing things the way they start they used to see because of the security and the comfort that they lived in. They they saw what were what seemed like true in human eyes and not sought to see God, and they were just like so arrogant with it. They saw like literally there were evidence. Man. They took their eyes off God. And they were confident that within themselves they could, they could figure it out. <clears throat> I think I must have listened to Lauren Cunningham's teaching over the years on success and failure. And um, he mentioned one thing that's marked me over the years that the most dangerous place to be in is not in the place of failure, but it is in the place of success. It is in that place when we are successful. That's dangerous for us. I work a lot with the SPS, and uh, in the SPS world, in the YWAM world, you, know, you hear statements like, you know, I can give you the top four SPSs in the world, you know, and they name a couple of SPSs. And I've had people say, Musenberg is one of the uh, top five SPSs in the world, so if you're wanting to go and do SPS, go to Musenberg. Do you know, every time I hear that, I cringe. I cringe because I do not want us to come to a place where we believe, yes, we are one of the best. And we, and we stop seeking God and what he wants to do in the program or through the program. So sometimes I've had to say to people, you know what? Just, just stop that. Okay, just, just give people options where they can go and do SPSs. I cringe personally because I, I do not want, you know, years later to realize that, you know what, we stopped walking with God at some point and we've been doing our own thing. Are you guys the best DBS in the world? <laughs> oh, what are, you, what are you good at? What are you known to be good at? Oh, so and so is the best worship leader. It's a compliment, right? And we should compliment one another. But don't let that get to your head in such a way that it forces you to stop walking with God. 
So I'm not, I'm not in any way here trying to discourage you from being the best that you are, the best that you can be. What I'm trying to encourage you is as you are the best, keep seeking the Lord. One thing that doesn't make sense to the people of my country is how, how can you say YWAM is, is such a big organization with so many achievements and yet people are not being salaried, people are not being paid? And you know what my response to them is? You know what? Because it's built on the word of the Lord. YWAM is what it is today because People have been seeking God and hearing God and going to do what he says to be done. Yeah. And not necessarily because of some experience that we have. Of course, in that process, we use the giftings and the experiences that we have. But it's been about hearing the voice of God, seeking him. And this is why this is part of our foundational values as a mission. So the story of the Gibeonites does not end here. Years later, King Saul later broke the treaty with Joshua, which the treaty that Joshua had signed, and attacked the Gibeonites. So Saul attacked the Gibeonites. He did not honor that, that covenant, that treaty that had been made. So when, uh, still, later still, during the time of King David, a famine occurred in Israel. They had a drought. So David, being the man that he was, who sought the Lord, he went to ask God. So when David asked the Lord about the famine, God says, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. So now, Saul's sin is now affecting someone else, generations later. So this is 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. So to appease the, Gib the Gibeonites and put an end to the famine, seven sons of Saul were given to them to be put to death. Seven sons of Saul were killed in order to stop this famine. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 6. You guys still with me? Yes. Good. Any questions so far before we move on? Something I haven't covered, I haven't talked about, something you're curious about. <clears throat> I want to tell you one of my failures in life. Um, when I was back in Zimbabwe and leading a best, and I told this story yesterday at church. Um, <clears throat> You know, I had staffed DTSs and led very successful DTSs. And at this time, I was now doubling up leading DTSs and, and leading the best to try and just make things, make things work. And what happened is that uh, I became too busy for myself and I became too busy for God. It's like I was just trying to keep the balls in the air. I stopped having quiet time. I stopped reading the Bible to actually, as, as a way to, to show I, I love God. You know, you can read the Bible because it's a ritualistic thing. You know, Christians are supposed to read the Bible. You know, I would kind of read the Bible five minutes before lunch just, just, just to make sure that I feel, I feel good because I've read the Bible today. I really stopped, I really stopped you know, walking with God, having a relationship with God. And everything else outside from the exterior looked fine because we were, we were doing the Lord's work. 
I was working hard to make sure that God is glorified. You know, that's what I was saying. But never really talking to God. Never really taking any instructions from God, but doing his work. Until one time when a DTS speaker came, she had been coming to teach in our DTSs for a long time. And uh, she was teaching on spiritual warfare. And she came to me and she says, you know, God revealed a different way of doing something. And, and, I, and I just got a little disturbed in my spirit. Um, so I went to her and I said, you know what, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm uneasy about this. I, I don't think we should do this. And she said to me, this is the enemy. And I actually believed it. Because I was not in a place to hear the voice of God. I was not in a place to discern what was of God and what was not of God. So we went through it. We went ahead with a disaster which affected people. Guys, that story has mocked me. It, it puts a check every time I, I begin to run around and do stuff for God. And I ask myself, am I actually walking with God? Am I listening to him? Am I doing what he wants me to do? Because I don't want to I don't want to rest on a reputation of ago, 10 years ago, and I just keep gliding in that reputation. God is so fresh that he will give you fresh stuff every time if he wants to. And we need to be watching out for that. So I've learned from that. He restored me, but man, I blew it. I made a mistake that mocked me for years. Even going to the extreme that I, you know, I, I stopped believing I could be a leader. I stopped believing that I was, I was worthy to lead people. It was only but I actually started believing, yes, I can be in leadership. I literally felt like God came out in the, in the, in the, in the midst of the bush where I was hiding myself. It felt like God came out and he took me by hand and he said, look, we're going, to this, we're going to do this together. And I can happily say today that God has called me to leadership. But I have a scar. And that scar reminds me to always seek the voice of God. Seek the counsel of God. Amen. Amen. You guys are too quiet. Church. Church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's uh, let's finish with this for today. You have a question. Um, Go for it. That's a good question. Yes, uh, it, was, it was a mess that involved everybody. So I had to publicly repent, ask for forgiveness for that time and also the, the next few years that followed. And in some cases, I had to hunt down people that had been students in that school to go and ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Some that were still in the country, I felt like an email would not do it, so I would, you know, I would go, I would go to them. And not only did I deal with that, but also this speaker wasn't. I mean, it wasn't just me, but people came after this speaker too. And years later, she still had a grudge against me that I didn't protect her as the one who had invited. Her. And you know, I was 22. Leading a DTS and trying to lead a base. Never encourage anybody to do that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Any other question, guys?
All right. Let's look at chapter 12. Chapter 12. Chapter 12 will give you a list of kings that were defeated by Moses and also a list, a list of kings defeated by Joshua. Now, when you look at that list, what comes to your mind? What, what, what thoughts come to you? They've been busy. Yes. Sure they've been. Other thoughts? They have a lot of favor with God. They have a lot of favor with God. That's true. They have been busy. Because they, they, they had to fight, right? Yeah. They had to fight. But I think more than the ability to fight, I think what, what shows me here is just the, uh, the faithfulness of God to deliver all these kings into their hand. these kings into their hand. Faithfulness of God. So two things I want to mention here is God has given you a dream. You need to ask him, God, what is my part? And what is yours? Okay? I, I, meet, uh, I meet people that uh, tell me 15 years ago, God spoke to me about this, but you know what? I haven't really seen anything happen. And I asked him, what have you done? What have you done about it? Well, I haven't really done anything. I'm just waiting for the Lord. The Israelites had to pick up their swords, whatever it is they used, and they had to go in there and fight but in that fight, they knew that God is with them. He's fighting with them. And he's going to destroy all these people. Because as if you understand what you're supposed to do, it motivates you. But then, if you understand what, is, what God is supposed to do, in that dream he's given you, it makes you relax because then you don't have to try and do what, what is for God to do. Look, they are walking with God is never, there's no formula. Okay. There's no formula. I wish, I wish there was just one formula I could give you and say, this is what you do. But if God speaks to you and uh, if you get a sense that you're supposed to step out, you step out and he will direct you. He will lead you. Um, if you. If you stay when you're supposed to be stepping out, then, then you're not doing the right thing. So I think when, we, when, you, when you sense God is directing you or is spoken to you about something specific, just check with him and say, God, this nothing wrong with even come, coming before God and say, God, you know, you talk to me about this and this is what I'm thinking right now of, of, of doing it, okay? I'm thinking of doing a school. Is that the way you want me to, to go about it? Doing a school so I can equip myself so I can actually see that, that part of the dream going forward? Is that the way you want me to do it? And, and if it is, you know, he will, he, will, he will lead you. And if it's not, he will, he will direct you in the way you should go. I'm, I'm very sorry that I'm not able to give you a specific thing. But all I can tell you is that 
he speaks, he hears. And we can talk to him. Right? I know I didn't specifically answer the question, but... Yeah. I mean, I've heard of stories of people that felt of, at a sense that they were, they, they were supposed to go somewhere, and they just started walking. They just started doing stuff. And it turned out, you know, it was God. So I think we just lean on his faithfulness. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, th I look at people like Paul, who he was, Paul was called to the Gentile world. What did he do? He went to the Gentile world. Right? And whenever God did not want him to preach the gospel, he, he told him, don't, don't preach there. Okay? And sometimes he has to get a vision of a man from Macedonia. And the phrase they use there is, we perceived that God wanted us to go to Macedonia. Right? I think sometimes we complicate things that are supposed to be simple. Good question. Thank you. Any other question or thoughts? Okay. Yes. There's always a desire in us to create a system. But I just think for them as well, like, as God's leading them to conquer land, like, consistently found how tempting it would be to create a system out of how to take land. I guess I was just wondering that. I just, you know, asking about. To be honest, I think even with this chapter 9 thing, was sort of coming that arrogance and wanting to make it things easier for themselves and not necessarily seek the Lord. But uh, I also know when I look at chapter 12 and I look at their successes, I also know that uh, Joshua is a leader during this time period. He's learned a few lessons, some from Moses and some from himself. You know, when, and, and he's learned to follow, the, to follow God, to follow the promptings and the, the leadership of God. Now that doesn't actually deny the fact that there, were, there might have been temptation to just say, look, Last time we took them out this way, I think let's just go and do the same with this king. Uh, if, you, if you read how they dealt with this king, is that God was actually involved in the details. So I think we should give it to them and say, even though there might have been a temptation to create a system, they were faithful in listening to God and following God uh, for the majority of the time. That's why we have this list, that they conquered these this people. That's a good point. So what you're referring to are specific situations where God says this is what you are supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to live life. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about military strategies right. um, of how they took the land. Good question. But the context here is 
is law and you cannot use a principle of, of peace in a time of You cannot use a principle of peace in a time of war. So they, they basically are aware of the fact that every, 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 every nation around them in this promised land, they must take them out. They must fight them. Now, I know that they must have thought that, oh, these people are far, are far from, from us. They're not, they're not actually from, from close by, and therefore we're not supposed to fight them. Very well, they might have thought that. But I think it's, they, they used a different principle in a different time, and that's why they got it wrong. I mean, how do you, see what is, what, what, what somebody mentioned that comment. That's talking about widows, that's talking about orphans, that's talking about aliens, right? It's not talking about a whole group of people that come and say, hey, we're here, we just, you know, we want to be part of you. That is specific. If widows come to you, if orphans come to you, if aliens come to you, you were aliens also in Egypt, and therefore you must bring them in. You must, you must allow them to, to, to harvest in your fields because you guys know how it feels to be, to be aliens. But I think the context here is very different. The context in in in, uh, in um, chapter nine is different. Anybody wants to? Isn't he just training them, continuing ongoing training on how to be in relationship with him and how to walk out in holiness, like they heard before? Like when they make a covenant with other people, it compromises their holy. Yes, yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's like the relationship that's actually, it's like you're married to God through a covenant, and then you make a covenant with somebody else, too, that you're not supposed to be making covenants with. So I feel like it's a relational issue, you know? Good. So what we know is that they were not supposed to do that. <laughs> All right? They were not supposed to do that, but they did. Whether they had good intentions, whether they thought they were actually living out scripture, the reality is they, they, they messed up. They were not supposed to be in a relationship with the Gibeonites, with the Hivites. Why? Right? Because they are one of the ites. That must be destroyed. Okay? So there could be several reasons why they did it. But what we know is that they were not supposed to do that. All right, we have five minutes. Questions, comments? I like you guys, you ask good questions. Yes, go for it. It's a comment about what we were just talking about. So is that okay for me to make? Yeah. Um, I think two things first off, they're not um, they're not uh, like aliens seeking shelter. They're coming because they want to make an alliance from a far land, that's what they're saying. So first off, they're not I don't think for the Israelites to obey the like obey what the Lord has said in the past. I think that would be a specific situation where maybe a people have been mostly destroyed and there's a few left, you know, like a refugee, basically. And in that situation, how they're approaching it is not as a refugee that needs whatever. They're, they're from a far distant land. They nice because they heard the Israelites were so great and so mighty. So that's not, they're not a wanderer in this, in their life. That's not, the Israelites don't think they're, you know, this uh, completely helpless people. Uh, but <clears throat> also, I think, they they have really clear doubt about where they're where they're from, you know. Like they they're like, well, how do we know you're not from? Obviously, they have hesitation that they know that there's a chance that they're from they're close by, and they're trying to make them prove it. I think it would have been uh, 
pretty darn easy. If they were uneasy, I mean, they're obviously uneasy because they're like they prove it. You know, they show their their worn clothes and their moldy wine skins and stuff. And if, if they had doubt in the first place, it wouldn't have been that difficult to consult God rather than just what they saw. You know, so I think I think there's like a clear. I think from that first, I think it's like pretty clear to feel like clue that they they weren't just like helpless people from what the Israelites knew. And then on top of that, they had a lot of hesitation. And thought them rather than just asking God about it, which they, they obviously had questions and then were somewhat satisfied because I'm sure it was making alliance, you know, so. Yeah. Good. You guys are awesome. I like it. I like that we're wrestling with these things. <clears throat> Is it okay if I pray now? Lord, we thank you for the book of Joshua. We, we thank you for what you are showing us from this book, that you are a God who is involved in our lives. You are a God who speaks, and you want us to hear you. You are a God who directs, and you are a God who makes promises and also keeps them and gives um, and them. And I pray, Father God, that um, as we're going to go away and just process this book, that you would speak to us what we must hear. I want to pray, Father God, specifically into the issue of the visions and the dreams that you have given to us. That you would encourage those that have become a little discouraged about these visions and these dreams. And Lord, uh, if there are some that are needing a, a nudge, direction, that you would give a specific word and you speak to them, Lord, in ways that are easy for them to hear you. That we can see it towards the fruition of our dreams. Father, I pray that we'll be known as a people that hear you, as a people that fear you, as a people that, that make it a culture to seek the voice of God and to seek the counsel of the Lord. But I also want to just celebrate your faithfulness, Lord, to us as individuals faithfulness that we see in this book, the faithfulness that we see in our lives. Lord, open our eyes that we can see you more. See you more, Lord. Because we desire you to be part of every, every aspect of our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us to help us understand this book. There are things we have not talked about here, Holy Spirit, that are really important. I ask that you would help us to get to those things as we look at this book, as we study this book, and as we study this time period of, of the children of Israel, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, so what are some of the things that you guys are hearing? What are,